Okay. Good evening. Thank you very much for coming to the Frontline Club tonight for this talk with Espen Rasmussen. If I can just remind you to please to switch off your mobile phones and when we get to the Q&A section, if you can talk directly into the microphone for the benefit of our online audience, that would be great. Thanks. Um, so I'm just going to pass over to Harry, Ar Harry Hardy of Panos, who's going to introduce Espen. Um, and he's an all-round photography guru, so <laughs> he'll introduce the night. Thanks. Thanks, Flora. Um, hello. Uh, yeah, my name's Harry. Um, I'm not going to really say that much, to be honest. I just really want to introduce Espen. But um, I was kind of digging around uh, and looking at a few things. And I, I thought I'd just start with a few statistics that I thought were quite incredible. That um, Espen, you know, has two World Press Awards under his belt, as long as um, seven, seven Picture of the Year International Awards. Um, and on top of that, 26 uh, Norwegian Picture of the Year Awards, which um, is pretty impressive. Um, but it's not really all about awards, obviously. Um, another thing that is incredibly interesting about Espen is that he's the picture editor of VG, which is um, Norway's biggest daily newspaper. And having had a past myself in, in photo editing for, for national papers, the relationship between a photographer and a paper is an incredibly interesting one. And so to be either side of that wall, I think is very interesting. And I think, I, I think, I hope maybe Esmond may talk about this later, but I think some of the work really shows that kind of understanding of talking to an audience. Um, but yeah, in 2008, uh, Esmond was awarded a major grant from the Freedom of Expression, Expression Foundation um, that really gave him the time and the space to follow his major sort of personal project, which was um, the study of displaced people and refugees on a kind of global scale. Um, and, and that piece of work essentially became transit. Um, my feeling about transit and the body of work is really that it's such an amazing example of photography working as document. It's, it's really special. It's a very heavyweight piece of work. Um, and of course, the, the, the books are here tonight. And I wanted to just say a few things about the book. Um, the book was published by Dowie Lewis, who's here, which is great news. And it's a really special book. I was kind of reacquainting myself with it uh, today. And there's something very, I'd say, not cinematic, uh, essentially, but filmic. I mean, the opening sequence of the book is, is like the opening sequence of a film. You're introduced to a character, and you don't know who he is, and there's something terrible happening to him, and it's really claustrophobic. And then he disappears. And then you get the titles. And then it, there's numerous stories that go from all, all places, completely global, and you don't know how they entwine, but there is this same story. And it's real, and it's really sinister, and it's, and it's crazy, and it's beautiful, and it's people's stories. Um, so I really suggest, I mean, Esteban's going to talk about the work, but I really suggest looking at the book as well. Um, but yeah, without further ado, I will pass you over to Esteban. Uh, thank you so much for kind words, and uh, thank you all for coming. Um, yeah, I'm Esteban. Um, I'm here mainly to present my project, which I've been working on for seven years. Do you hear me? Is it okay? Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, it ended in a book, as you said, by Davi, uh, published by Davi Lewis, in, 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 uh, and it was uh, released at the same time as the exhibition in Oslo at the Nobel Peace Center in, uh, in uh, May this year. So my plan tonight is just to bring you, uh, take you through the, the project, tell you about the work, uh, some of the stories behind the pictures, and <coughs> also um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the combination. I, have, I work as a picture editor, as you said, and uh, I'm going to tell a little bit about how I kind of manage to do projects and have a steady, kind of family-friendly uh, job as well. Uh, so that's, um, that's my plan for tonight, and I would really appreciate if you ask questions. Uh, if you don't agree, shout out and, uh, and raise your hands and do whatever you want. Uh, uh, so I, I think I'm going to start just with a video. It's uh, a bit long, but I think it's uh, good because um, one of the um, most important parts of this project is, uh, is uh, a guy uh, from Iran, a Kurdish guy I followed for three years now. Uh, who, his name is Rahman, and he, he came to Norway as an immigrant and uh, applied for asylum. And that's the start of the book. 
And, and um, I met him at a reception center in the north of Norway. He had just arrived. And I started to follow him through the process of applying for asylum. And, uh, and that's also the story in the book. I follow him. And, and uh, at the end, he, uh, he rejected the asylum. And he, he flees from the, the reception center and hides. And that's, uh, his story is really a story about, I guess, between 10 and 15,000 people living in Norway without papers, without any basic rights. And, and I have this short video, or not short, but maybe six, seven minutes, I would like to show you just to put you into his um, kind of life before I show you the pictures. So, um, and let's um, see if this works. Det er ikke lett. Hvorfor er jeg kommet til Norge? Og hvorfor er jeg må, må kunne se min fremtid? Hvorfor er jeg må ødelegge mitt liv? Hvorfor er det sånn? Jeg er, jeg er en, et menneske, samme som dem. Jag samlar familjen min mest. Jag samlar pappa, jag samlar hela familjen min på alla måter. Fyra månader till, det blir tre år, jag har inte sett dem. Jag har inte sett dig, jag har inte sett dig, jag har inte sett dig. Jag har inte sett dig, jag har inte sett dig. Jag har inte sett dig, jag har inte sett dig. Jag har inte sett dig, jag har inte sett dig. Jag har inte sett dig, jag har inte sett Så vi har kommet ut av lasta bilen. Jeg fikk 200 kroner fra han, men jeg skal simulere den 200 kroner. Så sa jeg, du kan uh, gå til centrum. Så plutselig jeg tog toget til centrum, og jeg kom dit. Det var natta, skjønner du? Jeg har kommet til uh, en butik som er kurdisk butik, kurdisk kaffe heter det. Så da jeg fikk jeg hjelp fra dem. Jeg var veldig redd, for jeg visste ingenting om Norge. Ingenting. Og så det var, jeg synes det var veldig skummelt. Jeg var sånn nå den dagen. Bauer! Bare ikke bra. Tung. Jag syns jag är helt alene, jag har ingen. Men plus det jag kommer till nästa, det var massa fina människor som var där. För exempel Lilian Hans, men alla samma, det var samma som mor och far till mig. De har hjälpt mig så mycket att jag glömmer aldrig. För två dagar sedan jag har snackat med Lilian. Jag sa jag kan aldrig glömma dig på ingen måte. Och så sa hon, jag är åh. Så det var väldigt mycket för mig. Når en norsk kvinne vil ikke glemme meg. Det var mye aktivitet på Nesna. Mye, mye. For eksempel, vi, var, vi hadde svommehallen i Iran. Jeg har aldri svommet der. Aldri. Og jeg har svommet på Nesna. Jeg har aldri spilt til fotball, jeg har spilt til fotball på Nesna. Jeg gjør det alt mulig som er bra på Nesna. Jeg kan aldri glemme Nesna. Det var veldig fint for meg. Når jeg står ut på morgenen, jeg, jeg ser utenfor vinduet hva som skjer der. Når jeg ser elever som går på skolen, det gjør meg trist veldig. Veldig, veldig. Hele tiden jeg tenker på skolen, ikke mer. 
ani ya veli kelev ya ya li ke blido fodi vur fli elev eta va eta tu afshlaga Veli deprimet, ja vet ki vaj skalsi, veli, veli vaj skalsi. Ja ja ima vare, ja vel vare in noge, fodi ja i lerte noge, ok so, ja i molare mija, ja i har fot avšlag. Man, ja i tjenker vare in noge, aldri kan ike go ut noge, aldri ja i kan ike. Ja i tjenker, ja i go po, po skoda. Eter saks mu saks or ja ibeli politin orga a an ja tur all drum all ad deva drum ja ja sinus den dagal idi eller advokat bina knust hele mit liv hele min fram fram tid nur fa man for sava fra idi so de bete mia man nur du for afslag Så det betyder ingenting så du har inte minska och inte vara i Norge. Så de har sagt rätt ut till mig, du kan inte vara här längre. Jeg vet ikke hvor den blir min fremtid. Jeg er litt vanskelig. Jeg tenker på det hele tiden. Jeg håper det blir bra. Men det vet ikke enda. Blir det bra eller ikke. Jeg vil være i Norge til død. Jeg vil ikke flytte herfra. Aldri. Også, jeg er glad i kjæresten min. Jeg elsker henne veldig godt. Jeg elsker henne meg veldig bra. Så det er viktig. Det är väldigt vanskligt att jobba utan papper i Norge. Du jobbar på en restaurang. Han utnyttjar dig han som är äger. Och så du måste jobba 13-14 timmar varje dag utan att ha fri. Så där man blir helt kaputt. Och visst du jobbar 13-14 timmar varje dag. Vad slags liv det är. Visst jag hade haft papper. Så jag kunde jobba hos norska. Så jag kunde jobba på en fabrik. Jag kunde jobba på, på en städ som är skicklig. Men... Vad ska du göra när jag har ingen papper? Till och med det är inte jag har inte. Jag var hos läge en dag. Jag hade väldigt vond ryggen. Så uh, jag skulle ha personnummer. Så hade jag inte. Hur ska jag skaffa personnummer? Det var vanskligt, väldigt vanskligt i Norge, uh, liv utan papper i Norge. Det är inte det. Men jag drömmer hela tiden när jag får uppehåll. Så vi säger för på så mitt liv går väldigt bra. video introduction to Roman, which uh, is, um, I still follow him and I still have a lot of contact with him. Uh, and he's uh, still in the same situation. He's working uh, working uh, at uh, fast food chains or at uh, uh, restaurants and earning small amounts of money, just enough to pay the rent to the guy who owns the restaurant. Because uh, that's how a lot of these people end up is that they they, they work at the restaurant and they get to rent a room from the owner of the restaurant. So actually the salary they ha get, they have to pay back to the owner of the restaurant. So they just end in, get into this uh, bad, evil circle. And it's really difficult to get out of that circle. Uh, I won't go into details about, his, um, about what brought him to Norway, but he, 
he has been um, he, he he claims and I really believe him he's a he's a really nice guy he learned Norwegians in six months he, uh, on this video he's uh, speaking perfectly Norwegian uh, and and he he um, he, he claims he was uh, in the mountains. He never went to school in Iran, and he, he was uh, herding the, uh, his father's sheep. And um, at the same time, he was running with messages for the guerrilla, the Kurdish guerrilla in the mountains. And uh, when he was on the mountains, uh, his father came up to him and told him that the police was at the door looking for him. And he just fled from the mountain just to... Uh, uh, over to Iraq, uh, didn't manage to bring anything except money, which his father sent to him in Iraq uh, a couple of months later. And then he went to uh, Istanbul and then on a, on a lorry to Oslo. So that's, uh, that's how he ended up in Oslo. So I continue to follow him uh, still. Uh, it's a bit difficult, you know, because sometimes they, um, they have uh, their phone off and suddenly they change their phone to a different one because they haven't been able to pay the, the bills. and, and, bills and, and So uh, it's a bit on and off, but um, he's, he's doing fine, uh, even though he, he, he's still... Uh, the only thing he's actually talking about when I meet him almost is school. He really wants to go to school and learn things. So that's the, that's the opening chapter of the book, and that's, um, um, that's um, a project I started on three years ago. Uh, but the, the main project about refugees and displaced people around the world, I started on seven years ago. Uh, and it wasn't really a project in the beginning. I, I went to, to Chad in, in uh, close to Sudan. Uh, to document refugees coming from the Darfur province in, in Sudan who fled over to Chad. This was in the beginning of that conflict and uh, there was uh, tens of thousands of people coming over the border. So I went there and to do as a freelance a story for VG, which is the paper I work for. Uh, and, um, and often when I go out on stories like that, I, st I tend to stay for maybe a couple of weeks. Uh, the paper would like me to stay for maybe one week, but then I try to get one more week, with, maybe without payment, just to be able to go a bit deeper into the story. So I did that in, in, in uh, Chad as well. And I get back home, published the story, uh, and went out again on a different story, but this one also on the refugees in Serbia. And that was when I started to see that this could be uh, something more than just single stories. Uh, and um, I tried to search for projects uh, to see if there's been like big body of works on refugees and displaced people. And of course you will find those kind of stories uh, on different places. But what I wanted to do was to try to not focus that much on the conflict and the wars. And I would like to, to look more into how these people lived and how they survived because it's a fact. Uh, even though we might not get that impression from the papers and magazines, that most people survive. Uh, they flee and they end up in a camp or in a, in, a, in, a, in a cabin somewhere, but they manage to survive and they manage to give their kids food and some, uh, quite often they manage to get their kids to school as well. So I thought I wanted to make a project that not only focused on death and war and, and all the kind of bad uh, effects on being a refugee, but I also a refugee, but I also wanted to focus on on their daily life and and how they manage to to sustain a, a life. Uh, so, what I'm, but that's kind of into the uh, into the project. I'm just going to start with um, with um, uh, showing some of the pictures of Raman and and um, <coughs> and please uh, ask questions if you have anyone. Uh, so this, uh, this section is from this uh, immigration uh, center up north where people coming to Norway and applying for asylum are put into a reception center. Uh, then, and often these centers are placed in, a, in the middle of nowhere. Uh, so it might be people coming from a big, big city uh, and they end up in, in like uh, this place which is called Nesna and there's a lot about 1,500 people living there. Uh, so there's not much going on, but Raman is a really positive guy. So he was extremely happy being there. Uh, and uh, he made a lot of friends and, and, and there was a Kurdish kind of um, uh, group 
or people living there. So I, I, I spent a lot of time together with them. Uh, and uh, I met him because I went there to, to document life on a reception center in the beginning. And that was for a different book in Norway. Uh, and that's when I met him and, and started to follow him. And, and uh, I went up and back and forth to, to this place uh, several times during, uh, during the first year. Uh, and um, he is, um, I mean, there's, uh, for me, it's two different ways of doing photography. One is to, to meet someone and get a really close personal uh, kind of relationship with that person. And that brings me very close to this person's life. And that is, for me, really nice because you have kind of unlimited access in a way. The other way of doing photography, which I also do a lot, is to uh, just walk around and do pictures and step into people's houses when you're invited, uh, start to talk with people, and then keep on walking, looking for scenes, looking for pictures that could be uh, describing the, the story you want to, uh, or the story you're making. So that kind of the two ways I'm, I'm, I'm doing my photography. And with Rahman, it kind of turned into a very personal relationship quite soon because he was writing a diary and, um, and I talked with him and I read it and I said to him, could you continue writing this for me? Because I knew at this point that uh, I was going to make a book and uh, a good friend of mine who used to be picture editor in Vega and who's been helping me a lot with the editing process of this project told me that this could be a good start of the book because uh, the, the rest of the book is from countries far away while this story brings the problem and, uh, and uh, the tra challenges back home in a way. So that's why I chose to, to, to put Raman or bring Raman into the book it's not only something that's going on in a distant country. It's something that's going on in London or in Norway or in Sweden or wherever. So, so, and also it's a much closer and, and personal story than the other ones in the, way, in the sense that I, I follow one single person. So he's, he's continued to write his diaries for me and, uh, and we ended up uh, <coughs> sorry, doing, taking out small parts from the diary uh, publishing it uh, in the book, but also using it in the exhibition as uh, as uh, just pages where you can uh, you can take up and read and, and get a kind of glimpse into his life when he, he stayed at the reception center. This is uh, this picture is actually from the day when he talked with his lawyer on the phone. These two people around him is is, uh, is they are working at the reception center, and he got the message that. Uh, the, uh, the application was turned down and uh, after that his life kind of turned upside down in the way that he was really hoping to stay. He, he thought he had behaved very well, he learned Norwegian, he went to school and he's uh, clearly a, a, a resource. And I mean in Norway there's a, uh, <coughs> I think 1.5% uh, or something of the population is without jobs. It's nothing. I mean, we need people to work, we need people to come to Norway. Uh, but even though uh, there's a need of people, uh, the government uh, say no to a lot of immigrants coming to Norway. And, and the, they claim the reason is that they're afraid of a wave of immigrants coming into Oslo and, and to Norway, which uh, might be true, but uh, I don't see a problem with that. And uh, this is far north, so it's, um, the climate is cl quite harsh. Uh, it's a lot of wind, it's just uh, the, ne the neighbor is the North Sea. Uh, so it's a very different climate that mm, a lot of these immigrants are used to. So they get to know Norway very well in six months. And here we are back here. This is after he left the reception center and we are in Oslo. Uh, he had a girlfriend for a while, uh, a Norwegian girl. And, uh, and, uh <coughs> and then he worked on different restaurants. He's still living in the eastern parts of Norway or southern parts of Norway. Uh, 
been working for McDonald's, uh, which is using illegal immigrants for uh, their workforce, uh, and also on on other restaurants. And and they pay him. Uh, McDonald's pay him so low and give him so much to do that he has to hire another illegal immigrant to help him clean the restaurant. And he has to take parts of his salary, which is very low, to pay this other guy who's washing the floors. So I mean, and, uh, and for him, it's, uh, he don't have any other options because it's, um, it's, uh, he's really afraid of being uh, caught by the police, even though the police doesn't really bother. They, they, they sent back a lot of immigrants, but it's all depending on where you're from. And, and I mean, to be sent back to Iran might uh, lead to serious uh, things happening to you, which is why Norway doesn't uh, force people back to Iran. So in Norway, he's, it's a strange thing, you know. He's in Norway. He's not allowed to be there. He won't get any papers. He won't be allowed to work. He can't pay his taxes or anything and they won't send him back. So he's uh, just locked in this uh, uh, strange place where he's actually a, a nobody in, a, in the sense of uh, having papers and so on. Yeah, this is, uh, this is from the McDonald's. I couldn't do his, pitch, uh, his face at McDonald's because I don't want him to lose his job there. So. Uh, and he lives in this uh, flat, which is a nice place uh, with four other uh, immigrants, paperless immigrants. And he, uh, they have to, so he's uh, working nighttime. So he's sleeping during the daytime. And then they, and then, but when he gets back from work in the early morning, they, the other boys who's living there are still sleeping. So we have to sit in the kitchen for two hours waiting for them to wake up. And then he can go to bed and sleep during the daytime while they are at work. Yeah, this is uh, just a picture of his diary to show you how he's kind of writing Norwegian day by day. Uh, he was writing these big books uh, and giving them to me. Uh, and um, s that's um, what I've been use using in the book uh, and also on the exhibition. Yeah, so that's uh, that's a story about the Roman which opens the book. And, and, uh, and I think uh, I'm... I'm I, I still follow him, as I said, and I still do pictures of him because uh, his story hasn't ended yet. Uh, there's a big debate in Norway about immigrants and illegal immigrants. We had uh, a big story last year about one famous uh, paperless immigrant who's been a lot in the media, writing articles, uh, speaking loudly about their situation, and she was forced back to Russia last year. And there was an outcry in Norway against this. And, uh, uh, and uh, 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 a magazine offered her a job. And when you're offered a job, you can come back as a working immigrant. So she actually turned ba uh, returned back uh, uh, to Norway after a couple of months. And I think the, the authorities was quite happy with that because they, they saw that the public opinion was leaning uh, in kind of her favor in that case. And um, yeah. This is Colombia. I, I'm going to show you pictures, not uh, in a chronologic way uh, uh, when it comes to the, which year I was there, but this is uh, how it's presented in the book. Uh, this is Colombia. I went there in 2007. Uh, and uh, there's around 4 million people internally displaced in Colombia, which I was surprised by when I heard it and read it. I mean, you don't. You hear a lot about drugs, and you hear about a lot about uh, the the civil war in a way between the guerrillas and and the government uh, troops in in Colombia. But you don't really hear about all these people who's forced to flee inside this country. So I went there, and uh, and uh, I went to the to the west coast to a place called Kibtu, and I went to the main. Uh, 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 to, um, to Bogota, which is the capital, uh, where around 400,000 people are living as displaced. So this is a funeral of, uh, I can just uh, tell you that story shortly. It's a, uh, it's a funeral of um, a, a five-year-old boy. And uh, he and his sister was uh, killed in the, in the slum where they lived. 
the mother had fled from her village because her husband was, ki was killed. She went to the slum with her two kids and she was uh, free spoken and she taught, uh, spoke loudly about the problems in the slum and the problems with the, with the, with the guerrilla and, uh, and, 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 uh, and the paramilitary groups in that area. And after a while, uh, she, uh, uh, the, her kids were killed. And, and she, what, what happened was that she went to a neighbor and, uh, when she, and the kids were uh, in bed. And when she got back home, uh, her daughter, which was eight, I think, was uh, killed in her bed. And her son was missing. And uh, she had to bury her daughter. And then a few days later, they found her boy, son sorry, uh, in a, in a, um, by the road, also beaten to death. Uh, so this is actually her third funeral uh, over a period of one year, I think. So she was alone now. Uh, she's not in the picture because I didn't want to to expose her because of all the problems she's been she's uh, experienced. But this is uh, this is one of the funerals. This is from the west coast where uh, there's a yeah there's a really uh, big group of internally displaced people living there. Uh, and back to, to Bogota again. <clears throat> so what I do in the book uh, is uh, I have these sequences of pictures, which is quite similar. Uh, and uh, I'm not showing everything because on a slideshow it looks very different from in a book where you can present many pictures on a page. But um, it's a way of trying to, to, in the layout and also in the stories, to <coughs> get a different kind of mood, but also uh, uh, the rhythm of the book needs to be different. So, so in uh, several places inside the book, there's uh, uh, collages of pictures like this, ones I'm showing you here. In, in uh, Colombia, I also worked... Uh, um, I, s some places I travel all by myself. Uh, most of the places actually I go by myself. <coughs> I used to be a reporter before I started doing photography. So I, I do interviews, I do writing and I make the stories myself. Uh, and I always make a story when I travel to a place and sell to Vega. I, I take time off from Vega to be able to, to, to travel and, and, uh, and I sell them a story to finance the trip. Uh, but often also I work with, uh, close with uh, Doctors Without Borders or the UNHCR or uh, Norwegian Refugee Council. Uh, not in the sense that I work for them, but they help me with contacts uh, to get into places where it's difficult to get if you don't work with them and, and things like that. Uh, uh, but most of the times I, I go without having any kind of agreed assignment in, adv in advance. I just, I just travel and I, I make a story out of the, of the pictures I, I take and the interviews I make and, and I sell it back to the newspaper when I back, get back home. And I normally I stay maybe for two or three weeks. So it's quite in intense. And the reason is I have a family, two kids and a, a partner and uh, yeah, she starts to shout a bit loud when I'm away for more than two weeks. And she's from the west coast of Norway, and they shout really loud there. <laughs> so uh, I, I try to get uh, to hurry back home. But uh, for me, it works very f good. I, I, I sometimes, I, a couple of times, I try to be even longer in the field. But uh, it tends to be just that you work not that efficient, you know. So when I'm out uh, for two weeks or three weeks on a certain place, I, I wake up at five or six in the morning. I work the whole day until late night, and I do that every single day until I'm back on the flight to Oslo. Uh, and uh, what I like about that is uh, the whole rhythm uh, is getting really intense. And, uh, and I get really quick into the story. And uh, because I know I only have two or three weeks, <coughs> I also force myself to meet a lot of people, to get both background info, to get, to get the stories of single persons. And, and when you get to meet single people or people in the in the in the slums or in the camps or wherever, you 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 get into this uh, environment where they help you and bring you to the next one and the next story. And that's how I'm how I went into this funeral in Colombia, uh, and that's how I, I met these uh, these people who were displaced people having uh, every year um, a masquerade or a, or a carnival. 
And this is from the home. Uh, it's a really uh, touching story, I think. And uh, some stories has kind of uh, burned into my mind uh, from these uh, different uh, journeys. This is uh, Anna Melinda, and she has uh, 11 children, 12 children. Uh, and her husband is working on a banana plantation far away. And she, he came, he returns maybe once a month to give her some money. And she's taking care of this, uh, all these children by, by herself. Uh, and it's just, uh, it's, uh, for me, this is, uh, when you tell the story about her, people say, oh my God, it's really, how does she manage? But for me, this is a story about people manage, you know. They, she is taking care of all these children which for me is amazing and tells me that no matter how hard it is, no matter uh, how far away from ho your home you are, you, you kind of uh, cope and you manage to find a way to survive. Uh, and um, I think that's positive and a, and, a, and a good thing to see, even though I would much more like to see her back home, of course. Yeah, then this, uh, this is from Congo, uh, went there 2008. And my plan was to go there to document daily life in these enormous camps you have in, uh, in uh, around Goma, which is in the east of, of Congo. Uh, when I got there, uh, after a week or so, the, there was a peace deal between this uh, warlord and the Kunda and the Congolese army, uh, but that deal was suddenly it wasn't a deal anymore and they started to fight really heavily. So during a couple of days more than 100,000 people fled towards the camps where I was working. So in, in, in Congo I actually got to, to, to document how this mass movement of people are, are taking place and, uh, and I managed to, to see how these camps when a lot of people suddenly arrive, how they cope with this influx, uh, massive influx of people, uh, which I felt was really interesting because, uh, because uh, uh, normally when I travel, I don't go to a place where there's an intense conflict going on. There's often uh, a long, long silent conflict that doesn't really get that intense. But here we were fighting just a few miles away. And um, yeah. So, and it was also difficult to work because uh, a lot of people were hostile because uh, they felt that the UN peace force, which is there trying to, to protect the civilians, uh, they didn't do a very good job and they don't do a very good job there. Uh, so the, they, there was a lot of anger towards, uh, towards both uh, the UN, of course, uh, me as a white person, and, and but, <coughs> but that kind of lasted for a couple of days and then people get settled and, and the people get Kind of, the, a lot of these people are used to fleeing, you know. They, they flee and they stay in a camp or they stay in a church or an old school or whatever for some days or some weeks or some months and then they try to return back home. And they stay in their house or their home for some months and then there's new fighting and they have to flee again. So they're going back and forth, back and forth. And in a way, they're, uh, it's sad to say it, but they're used to this kind of movement and to bring their most uh, precious belongings uh, uh, when they have to flee. This picture, it's, it's interesting because um, in the exhibition in, in, at the Nobel Peace Center in Oslo, there's a small selection of, of pictures from the book. Uh, and uh, one of the pictures I get the most uh, feedback on is actually this one. Which uh, for me is a surprise, uh, because in a way I'm, I, I think it's a good picture, but I'm not like that's not one of my favorites. But um, uh, the peace center has a deal with all the schools in Oslo and uh, in the east of Norway. So they have every day there are several groups of or classes coming in with young people watching pictures, and they all respond to this one. And uh, when the guide asks them why, they tell that they are smiling. You know, it's so simple. It's, uh, it's people smiling because in a, in, a, in, a, um, in a collection of pictures where there's so much uh, uh, seriousness and, 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 uh, and in a way sorrow and, and difficult 
uh, way of living, um, they, they, when they see someone smile and they see the face of kids smiling, uh, they, they react uh, very, um, very directly to that picture. So I think that's, uh, that's, and I'm really happy I brought that picture on because I think that's also important to show. I, I mean, I go in a camp in Congo and, and, and uh, you have a hundred kids around you, you know, uh, playing around, shouting, laughing and doing things. And uh, in a way you don't do those pictures that often because uh, you do it because you want to please them, but you don't bring them on into the, into the, uh, into the project or into the story because uh, you don't feel you have control of the situation and you don't feel it's a, uh, the right way of showing the, the, how the life really is there. But, uh, but uh, even though you don't do the pictures or you don't put the pictures into the project, it's, it's a reality. They're happy, you know? They're playing, they're playing football, they're running around shouting and, and so on. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's fair to, to, to also show this part of, uh, of their life. Afghanistan, that's um, 2005, um, where I, I went both to Pakistan and Afghanistan uh, to try and um, uh, to see on, look at the refugees returning back to Afghanistan, to see how they were coping and how they, uh, if they managed to kind of create a new life. And I also went to Pakistan to, to see the, the Afghan refugees still living there. There's millions of people, or millions of Afghans still living in Pakistan, but the UNHCR had this program of trying to return a lot of them back to Afghanistan when the, 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 the was in 2005, the, 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 the country was quite stable in a way. But what I found was that a lot of people came back to Afghanistan, their houses were occupied by other people because they had maybe lived in Pakistan for 20 years or 25 years. So they came back home, they didn't find a job because there's uh, no jobs, uh, they didn't have a home. So what they ended up with was to be uh, displaced within their own country. Uh, so I focused my, um, most of my time there on these people living in the outskirts of Kabul, where they, they had settled in these uh, old ruins from the Soviet period in, in, um, in Kabul and uh, were trying to, to create their li a life. Uh, this is maybe one of the most, uh, the areas or the places I've been where they are struggling the most. And the climate is of course also um, a thing here. You have winters, they didn't have heating, they didn't have, there were no windows, no electricity, nothing. So I mean, uh, especially the kids running around with the one shoe or no shoes, um, it was quite hard to see. And then they, uh, some of the returnees, they had been giving uh, land from the Afghan uh, government to build houses. This is on a, in a place called the Shomali Plains, which is a huge, huge open flat land. The problem was the fields they had received were in the middle of nowhere. No roads, no communication, uh, really hard, hard climate, a lot of wind. So. Uh, so, I mean, they, 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 some of them tried to build houses, but this, uh, this old lady here, she has just digged kind of a hole down in the ground and uh, put a roof on it uh, as a temporary place to stay because she said this for her, who's old, there's nothing to do there. She can't move, she can't get around, there's no way she can earn money. So, uh, so it wasn't an ideal place to, to, to start building a house. This is, um, I think, also in 2008. I, w I went to Yemen and, I, and I, I did that actually as an assignment for the VG newspaper. I proposed a story for them. And then I uh, traveled there to work on that story. 
and then uh, after maybe a week, I wanted to stay longer. Uh, my partner's was, partner was uh, really, really, really pregnant. Uh, she was actually due a couple of days after I was planning to return back home. But then I felt like this story wasn't, uh, I haven't been able to tell it really in the way I wanted or the way I felt important. So then I had to call this uh, partner from the West Coast again and uh, to ask her if it was okay for me to stay some few more days. And she kind of replied, uh, yeah, I guess that's fine. I'm, I'm uh, supposed to give birth in a couple of days. So will you make it? And I was like, yeah, but normally, you, because you have many kids, or you have two, soon three kids. And uh, she was like, uh, no, um, uh, but I, I said, normally you, you go way over time, you know, so this should be safe. And she was uh, nice enough to say, okay, that's fine. So I stayed uh, for five or six more days. Uh, uh, after I finished the assignment for the newspaper uh, to, 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 and uh, what I decided to do was to live on the beaches because in Yemen you have both refugees coming from Somalia mostly uh, and they arrive on the beaches uh, almost every day uh, thousands of people and the stories their stories are they were really really uh, uh, dramatic because um, uh, they are they go with people smugglers who bring them in old, old boats over the Gulf of Yem, uh, Aden. And, and the boats are in really bad shape. They, they sink and they, the, the, the smugglers, they don't dare to bring them all the way into the shores of Yemen. So what they do is to dump them in the water um, quite far out in the ocean. And of course, a lot of people can't swim. So we have many, many people droning uh, uh, as they try to get to, to Yemen. So I stayed in, uh, in areas where Somalis had settled down inside Yemen. A lot of them also continued to travel up to, to, to the further up in the Middle East. Uh, but uh, the, days I, the extra days I, I got to spend there, I, I, I stayed on the, on the beach uh, uh, on the Gulf of Yemen just to or Aden because I wanted to see when a boat arrived. Uh, so I, I try to kind of here I try to document what happens with people when they when they arrive after this boat trip, which takes two to three days. And my one of my uh, my uh, targets for this project has uh, has of course been to travel to different parts of the world to see different parts of the of the the the, the, the displacement story. But also I find it interesting to put these different stories together to see what's the differences and what's the similarities between being on a run. And uh, this uh, kind of, this one big thing I find that's uh, very, very similar. And that's that everybody is talking about getting back home and returning home. Uh, Somalis, they, they flee because of conflict, drought, but also because of... Uh, unstable economic conditions um, and when I asked them uh, so what would be kind of the your perfect life they they say well of course I would be to return back home uh, and that's what everybody says no matter where they are and what they're heading for uh, that's their kind of main hope for uh, the future is to to get back home so this, uh, this truck is from UNHCR, they collect people, they have people traveling up and down the coast uh, and they get messages from the, the, the Navy and from the Coast Guard uh, and then they arrive with trucks, collect them and bring them to these reception centers where they are registered as refugees and, and, and then sent to, to refugee camps. A lot of people decide not to stay in the refugee camps and that's uh, totally understandable because the, the camps are in the middle of the desert. It's, it's, they're to totally dependent on help. And a lot of people are coming to Yemen and they want to try to find themselves work. So uh, on the way uh, along these uh, highways on the coast, you, you will see a lot of people just walking through the desert for, de uh, d for several days, heading to the big cities uh, like Sana'a or, uh, or, uh, or Aden or other big towns in, inside Yemen. And this is, uh, this is from Sana, which has a big neighborhood of, of Somalis. Uh, and uh, I met this um, 
uh, woman who had two, had three kids, twins, and then a, a younger daughter. And uh, I talked with her for, a her for a long time. I was sitting there doing an interview and, and uh, listening to her story. And uh, suddenly she said, like, yeah, I, I feel sorry for my kids uh, because I have to work. And I said, like, but aren't you happy you have work so you can provide food and shelter for your kids? And she said, yes, but, but I have to tie them to the wall every time I go to work. And, uh, and that was kind of a sentence I reacted on immediately. And I, I stayed there longer and talked with her. And I went back the next day. And, and that was in the morning. She was off to work. And uh, she had already started to tie her children to the wall. And this is how they sit uh, almost every day uh, for five, six hours while she is working uh, as uh, uh, cleaning houses and, and doing things like that. And, um, and uh, so, I mean, it's a really difficult thing to say something about because it's really hard to see these kids sitting there tied to the wall. But at the same time, what is the alternative for her? Uh, she needs to work to provide the family food. She's alone. She doesn't have a husband. Uh, and she, there, there were neighbors, but they're all really into their own life and have their own problems. So I asked her, can't you get help from neighbors? And she said, no, there's nobody to help me. Uh, I'm very alone here. Uh, so this is, this is the only solution. And she was really afraid of them falling out of the windows because this was on the second or third floor. And she had gas containers there. So it's all these things she was afraid of. Uh, and uh, so the alternative for her is to not work and take care of the children. But it's not really easy to take care of children if you're not able to provide them food or shelter. So this is kind of what you see along the coast, people walking for days uh, to, 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 find, uh, to get to towns and get to work. And then, um, as I said earlier, I don't, uh, I don't uh, uh, try to find the big wars, and I don't, I'm really not really into photographing the conflict itself. But I felt that it's in this project I also needed to have uh, to show a bit or small drops of why is this all these people flying fleeing. So I, I went to Georgia a couple of days after the war broke out, and and uh, and. Uh, and documented people running away from their villages towards Tbilisi in inside Georgia, uh, Georgia and, and uh, also followed them back home when they returned back to their apartments or their houses. This is actually after the peace deal between Russia and Georgia. Uh, a couple returns back to their flat in, in, uh, in, um, in Gori. And then I went to, to smaller towns on the border between South Ossetia and, and Georgia, where a lot of people have fled, but older people uh, stayed behind uh, because they were too old to move or too old to, to flee in a hurry. So, so the main reason for me going there, uh, of course, to get stories of people, but also to get uh, the kind of... Uh, atmosphere and the sense of uh, what, what, why, why people have to flee. And uh, the people fleeing into Tbilisi, they ended up in all the uh, factory buildings, in office buildings and uh, uh, schools which were closed down. Uh, and they stayed there for s maybe a week, two weeks or three weeks. Uh, and a lot of them were able to return back home. And I know now I, would, I actually have a plan of going back because I want to meet exactly the people I met when I was there in 2008 to see how they end up? Did they manage to go back to the gardens and their their, their fruit gardens and their 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 farms and, and uh, apartments? 
uh, I think that could be interesting to try because I feel a lot of these stories are glimpses into into people who who are fleeing, but you don't really see what's happening to them. What what happened two years after or five years after? Of course, a lot of them are still living in camps, but I think like in Georgia, it would be interesting to see because this conflict was so short and there's a peace deal and uh, there's no conflict going on anymore. It would be interesting to see if they actually managed to 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 get back into a normal life again. This is a funeral I went to, it's um, a family, who, uh, their mother was, uh, she was hurt in, the, in Gori when the, 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 uh, the war was at the most intense between Russia and Georgia and, uh, and she was wounded. And they brought her to, to, to Tbilisi uh, to safety, but she died there. And then they, after the peace deal, they returned back to Gori to, to, to bury her. So this is uh, the funeral in, in uh, her hometown. <coughs> so this is what I talked about in the beginning, the first kind of um, story on displacement I did in 2004. Uh, and uh, as I said, this started out as a, as a kind of a freelance uh, story I wanted to do because the conflict was uh, quite new and I wanted to go there and see uh, exactly what was going on. Uh, but when I was there, I, 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 I always been interested in, 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 in stories of displacement and, and, uh, and movement of, uh, of people. And, uh, and uh, this, this story of these people really affected me because there hasn't been that much writing about it. Uh, uh, after half a year after I did this story, or maybe some few months afterwards, this escalated a lot, and uh, you got you got a lot more attention in the media uh, on this story. But when I was there, I felt that this was a story that really needed to be told, and uh, that's also this, the thing I feel about several of the stories I have in the book and the project, uh, like Colombia uh, and other places as well. Uh, so that's also kind of a criteria I use to when I when I travel around. To, to document and find places which is uh, not getting enough attention and which has, uh, there are still things going on there, there that needs to be told. And this was uh, uh, such a place when I went there in, in 2004. I had big problems in a way when, when you talk about editing pictures. Um, I, I really had problems uh, editing this story because this was done six, seven years ago. And I felt really I had devol developed myself as a photographer uh, during those years. Uh, so it, in, a w in a way, it wasn't really, I didn't felt it suited the book and the, and the, the other stories uh, uh, very well. But then after a while, I went through all the raw files again on all the pictures. I selected some new ones and, 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 and tried to look for uh, ways I worked in 2004, which could be related to how I work today. And I think I managed to kind of find um, a tone and a, and, a, and a way of storytelling that's similar to the other stories, which I feel is in important because when you look at this project from a picture editor point of view, uh, you really needed to uh, hang together in a way. Uh, because I didn't want this book and this project to only be single stories. I wanted to be one big story as well. and. Um, and uh, there's a lot of challenges when you do have all these single stories and you want to put them into a book because it might get repetitive, it could be you know, too much, too little, it could be way too many pictures, and, and also you need to tell new things and you need to tell them in new ways the whole time. So, so all these things I had to think about and to evaluate and that the process of editing this book took me three or four months, uh, going through all the raw files over and again and over again, printing thousands of copies, putting out the tables and, and moving in and out from the, 
from the edit. Uh, and which has been really interesting for me because uh, I, I did this, as I said, together with a, uh, a colleague of mine. And uh, my work is to be a picture editor in the magazines in, the, in VG. We have a, a weekend magazine. Um, so I edit everybody else's work normally. And uh, here I was standing, I had to kind of make decisions on my own work, which is way much harder. I mean, and that's also why I really needed help from my colleague uh, to, to, to dig into the material and go through the raw files and, and try to find uh, other ways to tell the story as well. There's some extra pictures in the selection. There's actually some more pictures than in the book. Uh, but it's almost the same, uh, same selection. <coughs> so, uh, after a while I've been working, I, I applied for a grant uh, in Norway. You have uh, something called the Freedom of Expression Foundation, which is uh, uh, really, really a good thing because they, they um, provide photographers, uh, filmmakers, writers, journalists with uh, support to make projects like this. Uh, so I received a grant from them, which made uh, I could intensify the, the work I could uh, take a year off from my newspaper. Uh, I, couldn't, I didn't get as big grant as I had salary, but I could at least uh, pay the trips and, uh, and the translator and all the practical things. And, um, and then I worked a bit as a freelancer to kind of support myself and, and to get a kind of minimum salary. Uh, but that meant that I could intensify the work with the, with the, with the book and the, or the, or the, uh, with the project. And I didn't, uh, it was in, uh, which year did we decide on the book? It's not that long ago. It's actually a year ago. Yeah, less than a year ago. So um, I worked on this project for maybe six years and then uh, Davi was uh, seeing the material through Panos, which helped me a lot with the project. And uh, we agreed on a, uh, to publish the book and we had a really, it was really in a hurry. We had just some few months because we, the exhibition was supposed to open a bit uh, in February this year. Uh, so we had to finish the book before that and uh, it was intense work uh, during some few months. Uh, but before that I could intensify the work because I got this grant and I, I, I traveled to, to uh, during a couple of years I traveled to maybe five different countries. Uh, to look into different situations. This is in from Syria uh, and you had um, uh, tens of thousands of Iraqi refugees coming there when the, the conflict in, inside Iraq was uh, at maybe at the most intense. Uh, uh, you had uh, almost a civil war going on in, in, in Iraq as well as the American troops and the British troops fighting there. Uh, so people came every night with buses, uh, 10, 15, 20 buses every night into Damascus in Syria. Uh, and, um, and then there was, uh, you had uh, these scenes of, uh, of people coming, but you also had these wonderful scenes of people greeting each other because families had been divided in Iraq, some had left earlier and some were coming later and then they met again in, in, in Damascus. And this is uh, from a, sh um, a kind of shelter for kids who had been through traumatic experiences. Uh, they had been either kidnapped or experienced uh, parents being killed or things like that. So they had this, uh, there were nuns who were running this place actually. And they, uh, they were able here to kind of live a normal life, play, learn and, and do things. And you had inside Damascus, you had a couple of areas who turned almost into Iraqi neighborhoods with Iraqi shops uh, and almost only Iraqis living there. And of course this also creates a kind of tension. Even though the Syrians at this time, they, 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 were, they had open hands. They received 1.2 million people in a very short period of time. And, uh, but what it created when that many people arrive at the same time is of course there's going to be a fight for jobs. So. Uh, the Syrians uh, didn't really like the way the Iraqis were 
uh, trying to get jobs because they said, okay, we can get lower and lower salaries. And the expenses for renting a flat were just going up and up and up because of all these people. But even though this happened, uh, they were welcomed and they were, they were really managing to integrate into, into the, the Syrian way of living. So this is a story of a small family and uh, their daughter was kidnapped inside Iraq uh, and uh, the father and mother had to, to get money to pay ransom for her. And after some days, they managed to, to get neighbors and friends to, to collect some money, and they paid, and, uh, and she was released, and they fled the same day to, to Syria. Uh, and uh, this is maybe five, four or five months later, after they arrived in Syria, and she hadn't been speaking after that experience. So that's uh, uh, kind of the, the story with her. She went to school, but, uh, but she wasn't... Uh, over the over the shock of uh, that experience. This is at the reception center. The UNHCR is also work. Uh, we're also working in Syria, registering all the refugees because. As a refugee, you need an ID paper to say that you're a refugee. Then you have the rights, or you're supposed to have the same rights as, or get the, the, the rights as a, as a refugee, which means you, you're supposed to get shelter, you're supposed to get, uh, be able to do some work, and, and so on. And uh, when we're talking about papers and, and the rights of being a, a, a being a, a, a refugee in Bangladesh, I went uh, in 2008 and 2009, uh, uh, 2009 I think it was, uh, to photograph the Rohingya people in Bangladesh, and they are in a totally different situation because they they, are, they fled Burma, came to Bangladesh, they're not wanted there, so the Bangladeshi authorities they not. Uh, accepting them as as as, uh, as asylum seekers and, and immigrants, so they don't get any papers. In the beginning, the UNHCR were there and they were heading out papers, so they had the ID papers, they could work and do things in the correct way. But after a while, when more and more people were arriving, the Bangladeshi authorities said, "Stop! We can't uh, we can't hand out any more papers." And of course, it's uh, you must be really desperate when you choose to flee from country and to Bangladesh, which is one of the uh, poorest countries in the world. So I met, I stayed there for a couple of weeks uh, and traveled along the coast and met uh, a lot of, uh, of uh, Rohingya people living along the beaches, uh, working as uh, with fish farming. Uh, they were collecting uh, small, small fishes which they sold to these um, bigger fish farms and, uh, and managed to, to earn a small amount of money. And then you have camps as well, uh, two or three big camps. Uh, this is on the east side of Bangladesh, around Cox's Bazaar. Uh, and these uh, camps are kind of divided into two parts. On the top, they are often on a, on a kind of a hill. On the top, you have the official camp with the people with the ID papers living. And then around the camp, on the, on the lower sides, you have uh, the unofficial uh, Rohingyas living, which are not granted uh, papers. So, the, the, of course, to live down there around this uh, main camp means that sewage and everything is just flooding into your houses and, and your living area. Uh, and uh, also they are under pressure because they're not allowed to, to move to other places because there's a uh, valuable forest there and, and the local people don't want to have people uh, in their forest uh, lodging and, and, uh, and uh, stealing timber, etc. So all these people kind of group or, 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 or uh, settle down around these official camps and you, you have a lot of health problems and health is issues as well because of this. So this, uh, they are not, uh, they can't, they are not wanted in Burma as well. Uh, and uh, I, talk, I, I was uh, interviewing and talking to a lot of people there, and, uh, and they tell that they are, they are forced, the Rohingya people in Burma are forced into kind of slave labor, 
they're, they're forced to build roads, they're forced to work in the forest without salary. They, uh, if they have a farm, they, 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 they are forced to, uh, to give the farm over to other people uh, and so on. So they, they, f they flee and get to Bangladesh, which is not granting them any papers and any rights. And uh, they can't return back to Burma either because they're not wanted there either. So they're kind of in the middle of nowhere uh, and invisible in a way. Yeah, and um, I'm um, soon, uh, I'm over time maybe, but um, I, I hurry up. And just uh, if you have questions. This is Serbia, this is a, this is a country I went to after Chad. Uh, in 2005, this, yeah, this is 2005, and I went to Serbia because I find it interesting. That's a country where a lot of people have kind of uh, uh, an opinion about what's happened there. You know, you're uh, you you have a kind of feeling towards one side or another one, and this is uh, this is actually Serbian people who are displaced within Serbia. They used to live in Kosovo, but when NATO, NATO started bombing Kosovo in '99. The, a lot of Serbians, or almost all Serbians, fled from uh, Kosovo. Uh, there's still people there from Serbia, but uh, a lot of them fled, and especially uh, Roma people had to flee. So I went to, uh, to, to, to Serbia and met uh, both uh, Roma people, but also uh, Serbians who lived in shelters and in, in old <laughs> kindergartens and in old schools as displaced within their own country. Uh, a lot of them wanted to return back to, to Kosovo, but uh, when I was there, the, 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 um, there wasn't any deal about the future of Kosovo as a province or as an as a independent country. So they were really afraid of, of going back because they didn't know anything about the future of, of, the, of, 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 their, uh, of Kosovo. <clears throat> so this is the uh, last uh, country in in um, in the in this project. I went to other countries as well, which is not included in the in the in the edit and in the in the book and the exhibition. But uh, this is kind of uh, I feel after traveling for seven years to different areas in different countries, I feel this is. Uh, uh, a, a, a fair way of presenting uh, people displaced uh, in different areas. Of course, uh, uh, some can criticize me for not being uh, uh, paying attention towards the m more towards the reasons for this happening, but uh, that has not been my goal at all. I, I, I have uh, been targeting and, and, and wanting to tell uh, stories about how these people are living and, 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 and I also feel uh, for you and me to see stories about war, it's um, often in the media you get the most dramatic pictures, you often get the most dramatic stories of, uh, of people dying and of bombing and of, of soldiers shooting. Uh, what I wanted to do was to, to, to not make the action but to, to see how uh, people uh, uh, coping in these kind of circumstances. So at the end of the, of the project, I, I also took pictures of beds, uh, uh, f people, displaced people, and how they sleep in different, uh, different countries. So I'm just uh, rushing through them, and then, uh, yeah. yeah. This is, sorry, this is Yemen. And this is uh, Norway, it's an uh, immigration center. And this is in Georgia, in, uh, in Congo. In uh, Yemen, yeah. Uh, sorry, this is in Syria and this is in Yemen. I'm back in Norway again. And Congo. And Bangladesh. And in Georgia. And Georgia. That's the last one, yeah. So that's uh, the project. Um, oh, I feel I talked a lot, so uh, 
I can talk a bit more if you have any questions. Any questions? Uh, so thank you very much for the talk. It was really quite fascinating and very sobering as well. Um, but having seen how so many people live and how they cope, obviously they do cope, but they are in a very difficult situation. How can how could someone like me actually help them out? Um, yeah, it's. Um, I think uh, my main goal to do for doing this project has not been well. Of course, the best thing would be if people kind of engage directly and and try to help by volunteering for an NGO or or doing something really directly. But I think uh, the main reason for why, why I'm doing this is to, 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 to show these people and, and to, to make you aware of them. Because I, I feel it's, and I think that's important, that we know about these people and that uh, I show them and that other photographers and, and uh, other medias show uh, how they live and how they're coping and, and, uh, and uh, how they live their daily lives or what the situation is right now. Because we tend to, media tend to jump from one place to another one as the action moves on, you know, you've seen that in the north of Africa now for the last half year. Uh, you go from uh, Egypt, now you don't hear anything from Egypt because there's uh, another country who's in the focus and then it moves on to another one. Uh, so I think um, uh, what you could do, I think, is to talk about this and, and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and uh, debate it. And, and of course also, I mean, there's several good NGOs who's doing a credible good job. And, uh, and I think that's important to support them as well. Uh, even though I see also, after traveling it's for seven years, I see a lot of problems of uh, the Western world sending NGOs into the field uh, to help uh, people displaced. And the reason why, why there's problems, just to say that shortly, is that a lot of uh, refugees and displaced people, they get dependent on the help. And they're not able to move on and to get back to their uh, to their homes or to their to their uh, normal life again because they get to help where they are and they want to stay there but uh, even though that's a problem I think that's also a way you could uh, engage I mean uh, uh, the picture appeared in the paper of these two these three kids who were tied to the wall and I got in tremendous amounts of emails and phone calls from people when the newspaper in Norway published it how can I help and, um, and, and, uh, and I, I refer them to UNHCR, which do a very good job there, and to other NGOs, uh, MSF and others. Uh, so, I mean, that's also a way. But I think to talk about it, to deba debate it, and to not kind of look at these pictures and go back home and forget it, but to, to have it in mind, I think it's uh, one of the best things you can do. Yeah. Thank you very much for your work. I was just curious, how do you find those important stories that aren't being told? Like, what, how do you find them? Um, that's a good question. I mean, I've been, uh, I've been interested in this theme for, for many, many years. So I, I kind of knew about several places uh, before I started. Uh, and then it's just, uh, when I first started, I traveled to Chad. It's just, I just get into this kind of work. That's been my whole life. It's been my family and it's been this and partly the newspaper, but not that important during the seven years. <laughs> uh, and, and, and so you just get into that, uh, and you, you get to know NGOs, you get to know uh, a lot of people who work in the field, and uh, you get a lot of contacts, uh, which is really helpful. I mean, I, get, I got so much help when it comes to information and background from Doctors Without Borders, UNHCR, Norwegian Refugee Council, and other NGOs, and also, and also local people uh, you meet. I mean, uh, they provide you with, uh, with background, but also with uh, really interesting and good stories. So, I mean, it's just, uh, I feel that uh, I've been so deeply into this project for such a long time that it's just, it's, uh, I've been, I mean, I, 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 uh, I read books and, and articles and, and uh, online stories and uh, on NGO sites and everywhere. So, I mean, it's just, it's just comes to me in a way. <laughs> Hi, um, you, talk, you talked a lot about working with NGOs, using, you know, working with them in the context of using them to get access to places. 
Um, have you been approached by any of the NGOs you've worked with, or have you discussed working with them you know, on any of their campaigning issues directly as a sort of commission? Because that's a sort of trend that we're seeing yeah. more of NGOs actually commissioning photojournalists like yourselves. I mean, I, I, haven't, um, I haven't worked on assignments as being paid by them or anything. But what I do is that, uh, like in Chad, uh, it was really difficult to move around. It was in the middle of the desert. So I was traveling with MSF uh, in their cars. Uh, and, uh, and for that kind of service, in a way, I give them some pictures, you know. I do some pictures which they might want of a doctor working or or a good picture I get of, of people in a in a in a in a hospital or something like that as kind of thank you for the help which I feel is uh, important to do. But I I and I, I and I and I was asked by the UNHCR at the end of this project to do a, a job for them uh, to to travel out and photograph a couple of places. Uh, but I said no, because I feel I didn't want to, to tie this project to a certain NGO. So that's why I kept, uh, I haven't been involved when it comes to payment or assignments with NGOs at any point in this project, because I wanted it to be totally independent from any NGO or any, any kind of government or whatever. So, uh, but I mean, as you say, you see a trend now, and that's because it's really difficult to get funding for projects and stories like this. So you see a lot of photographers and, and, uh, and reporters uh, making stories uh, on assignments for, NS, uh, for uh, NGOs, which I feel is uh, uh, totally okay. I mean, it depends on how, I mean, MSF uh, or Doctors Without Borders, uh, when I've been traveling with them, they are really, really open to what I do. Uh, they don't care if I uh, do, I work on my own story. I don't work in a story that uh, that will fit them in any way. So I mean, it also I guess it depends on the on the NGO. Uh, but then uh, again, uh, photographers need to get funding and need to get some kind of payment to to survive. And I think uh, to work with NGOs is a good way of uh, or into the future to 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 get uh, funding for great photography and important photography and for stories that needs to be told. How do you uh, maintain your emotional detachment when you see all of these diverse you know, situations? Uh, no, I, 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 uh, I manage uh, well, I think. I, I have a family back home. I think that's really important. Uh, uh, of course, uh, I started to travel before I get kids. After I get kids, it's much harder to see kids. In, I mean, people ask me, why, how, do you think, how do you feel when you see dead bodies and uh, people dying? And I also always uh, answer that I don't think that's the hardest thing. I think the hardest thing is to t see people who, who are suffering, uh, especially kids. So of course it, uh, it's, uh, it's hard to see, uh, but I, in a way I, I don't know when you have a camera and you're working, you're so, I'm so intense and so into this, the, the thing and the pictures I'm making and the stories I'm making that I, I manage to get around in a way. And it, don't misunderstand me, I, I, I really get emotional and I, I, and I start to cry when I sit with people and listen to their stories. But uh, it, uh, it, it doesn't hang over me f for months and years afterwards. Uh, and I think that's also because when I get back home, uh, I of course sit in my office, I work with the pictures and write the stories. So I'm kind of within the story for a long, long period of time. But then I have two boys who are shouting in uh, the room next door and I have to run in and ask them to be quiet or to play with them. So you kind of get uh, really quick uh, back into your uh, daily routines and your uh, boring uh, family life. Or no, I mean uh, <laughs> happy, nice family life. <laughs> yeah. You happy? happy? Oh. Hi, uh, it kind of overla overlaps with one of the previous questions, but um, after all this time that you spend with refugees and displaced people, um, what do you feel you know about them? If there's anything. You yeah, know. yeah. Um, no, I, I feel, I, I, I kind of, as I said, I've been interested in this for many, many years, but I, after I started to travel, I see them much more as uh, uh, not victims, actually. Uh, and that might surprise you, but uh, 
but uh, of course they are victims. Uh, they have to flee and they're forced to flee. But uh, but they they at the same time, as I said, they 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 are really. I mean, they they people survive in the most hard and uh, difficult situations. You know, you, they manage, and that's uh, maybe the thing that's. Uh, uh, been the biggest eye opener for me. Before, I kind of looked at them uh, mostly as victims and as people who only need help, need help, need help. But uh, and of course they need help. But also they uh, they 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 provide uh, their families with uh, with the food and money and and manage to find jobs and they manage to do things that so they can they can survive. So I mean that's uh, that's. Um, one of the most important le lessons I learned. And uh, also I learned um, a lot about uh, finding ways to tell stories in a way that uh, I feel is, uh, is, to, is right uh, for them to tell, if you know what I mean. I feel that uh, I managed to, uh, because a lot of people are really proud, you know. They don't want you only to take pictures when they're lying there in the mud. They want to look nice, or they want to show you that they do good things with their family. Like a husband in a family in a refugee camp would like to, you to see that he is actually providing them with, uh, with food. So I think, uh, and that's uh, part of the pictures are kind of a response to that, uh, which I think is important. Mm. Yeah, just one question. Uh, yeah. why, why? I mean, my question, yeah, it's about the motions, but it's not about you. It's about uh, them. So if I was in their place, um, I touched on your point earlier that they're the most resilient people, yeah? Why should I open up to you and tell you my story? You know, you, you're not, for example, uh, somebody working in an NGO to bring me food or to uh, bring me a doctor to take out care of my kids. You're just a Western European guy with your camera writing. So why do I think that what you do is important, if you know what I mean? Mm. Yeah, and uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, I experience uh, <coughs> kind of, mo almost all the places I've gone, I mean, they've been opening their homes to me and inviting me home. And I think that's a lot about hospitality and in the culture. But also, I, in some places I've been, I've been met by kind of criticism or skepticism <coughs> because they say, Oh, another photographer. There's been 100 photographers here, it's like in, in, in Congo. There's been 100 photographers here, and every time they're here, they do their pictures, and they travel back home to their Western life, and nothing changes, you know? And what I try to do, and that's maybe I, I work, maybe, I don't know how all photographers work, but I, because I have a background as a journalist, I used, in this project, I, I guess I used 50% of my time uh, sitting down, writing stories, and interviewing people, and talking to people. And that has been my key uh, thing to get into their lives. Because one thing is to, to do a picture. Uh, a lot of people feel they need to tell their story <coughs> to really get their, you know, to get their story out. A picture won't tell my story. That's what people think. And I agree. I need words as well as pictures. So w by sitting down with them and listening to them and letting them tell, and it might take two hours, five hours, or a whole day. Um, I kind of get a, a much better connection and I think also they feel that I'm more honest than only going into the home, staying there for five minutes, doing some pictures, saying goodbye and walk again. And also I travel always with really good uh, fixers or uh, translators who kind of explain a lot to them and who knows the area and often they're locally uh, well known by the people living there, which also helps me a lot. But, but it's really, I feel always when I, when I travel back home from a place like this, I feel a lot of guilt because uh, who am I to go there, do my pictures and go back home to my family and my safe life, you know? Especially those pictures that you were in the funeral, this is what struck me. Yeah, and, um, and the background there is actually that the mother wanted me there. Uh, she didn't want to be, be photographed, but uh, she wanted me to, to document it. And, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's hard, but uh, at the same time when I go back home and I sit on a plane and I think about uh, what am I doing, why am I going, thinking I can go there and I just return back home. In a way, there's uh, two things I'm thinking about. One is that if nobody goes there, and nobody tells these stories, uh, nobody of you would react, nobody of you would care. 
And the other one is that um, if you, uh, you can't kind of suffer with them, you know what I mean? You can go there and you can uh, stay in a tent in a refugee camp for two years, but that won't either help, that w it won't help them in a way either. So that's kind of the two things I'm having in mind when I go back home. And I think I, 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 I show this project in schools and a lot of, and that's maybe, maybe that's, I guess that's the most, really the most important thing for me is with the exhibition, young people go there and see it, uh, which I feel is uh, really important. Uh, well, I'm afraid we've run out of time, but thank yep. you very much, Espen. You've been great. And people, books are on sale here, so make sure you get your copy uh, tonight. Thanks very much, Espen. Thank you. Thank you.